Hey everybody, welcome to season 4 of What's IGN Crushing On? I'm Karen Walby Solomon and I'm your host, and we're here to talk about what's hot in pop culture. Today's episode is brought to you by Syntec. Syntec is a technology company that sources and distributes industry-leading products and brands from around the world. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 11. Today on the show, we are joined by Mike Cabellian, Cabellian from Mr. Mayor. But you will listen to that interview late in the show. I know I, I started it by saying it almost like he's here now, but he's not. Um, but I am joined by my trusty homie, Leanne. Leanne, say hi. Hi. How's it going? It's good. Yeah, as, as, we, as we said, as I said up front, we have a great interview this episode. And um, it was very exciting. Mr. Mayor is a comedy series that tells the story of a retired Los Angeles businessman, Neil Bremer, who is played by Ted Danson, and he decides to run for mayor of his beloved city. He surprises everyone and wins the seat. And with great ideas and commitment to the community, he optimistically sets out to get to work shaking up City Hall. However, he quickly discovers navigating politics is not business as usual. There are opinions to be heard, ribbons to be cut, and foods to be eaten, all in the support of his fellow citizens. Luckily, he can rely on the know-how of his political veteran deputy, R.P., played by Holly Hunter, whose savvy and ambition make an equal parts friend and foil, and the dedication of his offbeat staff to keep him on the right path, as well as some inspiration from his teenage daughter. So Mike Abellin plays the role of Tommy, who is Neil's chief of staff. And this is such a fun show. It's created mm. by Tina Fey and Robert Carlock, who also did Kimmy Schmidt. Um, so oh, it's like it's that yeah, actually it's, explains it's, a lot. <laughs> it does. It's I mean, definitely I'm, like as off the wall as Kimmy Schmidt. Like there's moments <laughs> where you're just like, "What the f- is going on?" <laughs> <laughs> it is, and it like oh, it's just that that pure bit of comedy. So obviously you guys would know if you listen to the show, you you probably know that, that Tina Fey also did um, SNL, 30 Rock, Great News and many other films and TV shows and that sort of things. But um, yeah, and Robert Carlock is often her partner in that. So, I mean, we, you will hear in the interview later when I asked Mike, like, why he decided to audition for the show. And he's like, he literally just saw Robert Carlock and Tina Fey on the on the sheet and he was like i'm in i'm gonna audition for this show and then he was like and then they told him ted danson's in the show and bobby <laughs> moyne ahead and he was like there was just no done. losing done to be fair same when you when you were telling me that this interview is coming up and you're like oh we should watch season one because it's on showmax well it was on showmax mm. i think it might be off now and literally Stephen, i binged it in like a week because it's so good and it's so easy to watch. Like it's super light. It's like 20 minutes, short episodes, very light, very easy watch, but it's so, so funny. And like, I'm really appreciating Ted Danson in his bureaucratic man in a suit <laughs> energy. Like <laughs> it's giving, because the first episode I was like, oh, it's just like him in good place, <laughs> but not, but kind yeah. of. Like, because he's like getting to rock his suits and be that person. But I really like, like they, they do a lot more for his character here. Like, it is actually interesting how he chose to get into this weird space because of his daughter mm. and how he's like trying to set a good example <laughs> as like a single father. And then like his daughters are so just like a full character on her own, which is hilarious yeah. to see them interplay with stuff. And then yeah, Holly how is his daughter that young though? <laughs> I'm just like Yeah. <laughs> She's very young. Like I have old parents and even I'm like <laughs> But okay, yeah, because we didn't know because in one was. of the episodes, in one of the episodes, they like he was he's like seventy or something. Yeah, and she's like in high school still. So yeah, but I mean, his Wild. wife could have been very young. We don't know. Yeah, we they don't, don't actually. Yeah, I just yeah, it's, it's so good, 
It's also the only other thing I've seen. So his other chief of staff, the the lady. She's uh, playing, Michaela. Yes, Michaela, played by Vela Laval. Because she used to be mm. in My Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Crazy. She was like the yeah. neighbor. And I loved her in that. So like when we started watching and I saw her, I was like, oh, my God, it's the neighbor. Um, <laughs> very cool show. When I was watching it, so I also, I watched it and it was just such a joy. Like it was just such a burst of, you know, happiness for like 20 minutes, just just sitting down and this is how I felt while watching it, which I was so excited to get Mike on the show because I was like, you know, I'm, I, I really love this show. And another thing that I also quite enjoy about it is that the Ted Danson character, like usually when you see Ted Danson in a show, he's always a little bit like Dom. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. Like, but in this show, he's like, he's not dumb. He's just like, you know, he's a little bit old. So this like technology things he doesn't quite understand, but, but he's actually very like strategic and very smart. And like, you know what I mean? Like he's a good, nice person, but he's also quite smart. And like, you know, they show like these layers to it. You know, you can be a nice person. You can be a little bit not technology savvy, but you can also be a, you actually is a very smart person. And they underestimate that fact in him a lot. And you can see the way he works with RP, the Holly Hunter character. Like he knows exactly mm. how to maneuver RP or work with RP because, because of the fact that he's smart and he knows how to work with people. I think it's like they do, they do, underestimate him because it's that little bit of fish out of water energy so because Mm. it isn't like he's not used to politics he was a very successful businessman but he doesn't know how to play the political game and so like the first episode where he wins and everyone's like how did we get here oh my god this is a disaster because you see him kind of fumble and whatever but then to your point he kind of the way you see him strategically manage people because he's just a people's person Mm. like that's his strength so I mean, there is the there's the doors open for mishaps and for for him yeah. making faux pas, but like it's it's done in a very charming charming way. Mm. It, yeah, it, it really is. And um, Holly Hunter's character RP, she's like this very leftist, very like gruff, like like career politician type person, and just. And just like the the, the 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 juxtaposition between the two of them, it's also really great. And and the way and because it's an ensemble show, so we have, as you mentioned, Michaela, we have um, Neil Ted Danson and his daughter Orly, and Jaden played by Bobby Moynihan, and of course Mike's Tommy. So we have all these characters, but just seeing them also interact with each other is so mm. funny. Like the episode where Jaden and RP go on a trip and then they're like I, fall I, in love. <laughs> because Jaden is an insane character. Like he's just, Bobby Moynihan shines in the show because he's obviously <laughs> like, he's he's the funny guy. Like he's the person that's yeah. off the wall. He's a little bit outdated compared to the rest of the staff, a little bit older, also underestimated because he's been there. He has the history of so many things. So he does actually pull rabbits out of hats, which is great mm. to see. But he's also the person to be like the most left field in a scene, which just adds that much level of chaos. Like there's bits of it that remind me of Veep because of like a team that's like not, doesn't quite know what mm. they're doing, but somehow pulls it off. Um, but like way funnier, of- way less, way less awkward yeah. about it. Because <laughs> Vipa was just anxious the whole time because I was like, they're so bad. <laughs> no, it's 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 very it's 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 very smart and it's done well. Yeah, no, it gets even better in season two. Like if you enjoyed season one, season two gets better. So season two is premiering on on DSTV channel one hundred one on Mnet on the 9th of April. But by the time this comes out, it would have already aired, so you can catch it on DSTV now. And then it will be released weekly on Saturdays. But, oh, gosh, it was such a pleasure to talk to Mike. And he was so welcoming and so excited. And we both kind of, like, because we're more or less the same age. And mm-hmm. I was, I was when I was, like, I wonder if he thought I was, like, I was trying to make comparisons. I was making things up between the two of us. But, like, but listeners will know that the things that I say to him are, like, 100% me. Like, he... he he was talking about his comic, like comedic icons, and then he's like Conan O'Brien, and I'm like, 
Mike, you don't understand. I love Conan <laughs> O'Brien with my whole heart. Yes. And then he brought up like the pink powered engine. I was like, Mighty Morphin <laughs> was my formative <laughs> show as a child. And but because we are on the same age, you know, it's like obviously any mm. um, So I was like, oh, I wonder if you thought like, oh, she's just trying to find things in common. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I love Conan O'Brien so much. But <laughs> But yeah, um, um, this is our interview with Mike Bellin from Mr. Mayor. Um, so how are you? How have you been? Wow, what a big question to start with. <laughs> um, I've, I've been okay, you know. It's been a lot of publicity the last few weeks, obviously. Mm. Um, but it's it's nice because... This is the satisfying part of the job, right? You spend months and months shooting it and then you mm. wait for post-production to be over and then it's finally out and you can you can see it, you know, it's fun. I also don't get to watch the episodes before they come out. So it's fun to like watch it alongside everyone else and be like, oh, that's what they used in the final edit. That's great. That's a, like, <laughs> I also like, I forget some of the jokes. So to like hear them fresh, like it makes me laugh again and it's just such a delight. So, so okay, so tell me about why you decided to join the cast of Mr. May. I like... Bring me up to speed here. I mean, the the biggest thing was just the names involved. You know, I got mm. the script and it on the front page, it says written by Tina Fey and Robert Carlock. And it's like, great, that's it. That's all I need. You know, <laughs> I'll play anything. I'll play a chair. I'll play anything, you know. Um, and then and then I was told, you know, it's Ted Danson, Bobby Moynihan. They had already been cast at that point in time. So I was like, great. I don't think I'll get this. But at the very least, if I do the audition, uh, I will have gotten to like be in the same room as those two. And that's a lot of fun. Um, and so the fact that like I got on, it's like I it feels less like I chose this and more like I feel lucky and grateful to even be a part of this. You know what mm. I mean? Oh, man. But you perfect for the role. So <laughs> so so how would you say that the characterization of Tommy has changed from season one to season two? Um, I think in the second season, he's gotten a lot nicer, you know, um, in the first season, he's, um, I mean, he's still catty and, and a little mean that's in his DNA, you know, but I think in the first season, you know, the mayor is new in the office and no one really knows what to expect. So everyone kind of has their walls up. And I think Tommy has his walls up most of all, you know, he's, mm. he doesn't have an open heart. And now in season two, you know, they've been in office for a year. And so he's a little friendlier with his coworkers. I'm sure you saw in the first episode of this season, there's new people in the office and that kind of shakes mm. up his sense of the hierarchy. So he starts to align himself more with his old coworkers. So I think it's just the the big change is that he gets a lot nicer in season two, which is also a lot of fun to play because it's like, I don't have to make so many like mean catty jokes at the expense of my castmates. <laughs> but yeah, you also get to see like Tommy interact with... Yeah, as you said, the his his, but I mean, I really loved in the last episode, the um with Holly and the yeah, yeah, with, yeah. with the shopping scene. Oh my gosh, the base! Like, how Thank fun that was, was that? Oh my god, that was like one of my best days on set. That was so much fun, especially because Tommy is such a like stand and talk kind of character. A lot mm. of his jokes are just verbal jokes. And I'm comfortable with that. I love doing that. But it's such a nice challenge to get into your body and do something physical. And so anytime I get to like work with a stunt coordinator, it's like, okay, we're going to fight, but we have to make this look funny. You know what I mean? There were so many bits that didn't even make it into the final edit. Like we did this one bit where I grabbed a woman's hand and bit off her nail and <laughs> spit it at the camera. And it's like, that's such a funny joke. And like, there wasn't time for it in the final <laughs> edit, but like, that's the kind of stuff that's like, it feels like a new challenge for me. It feels mm. like a new thing for Tommy is to not, just say uh, a funny joke, but to like do something funny. With his, I think um, Bobby Moynihan gets to do it a lot. Jaden has a lot of physical comedy bits mm. and and Tommy doesn't have as many physical comedy bits. And so it's it's fun to be able to do that kind of stuff. So I, I really love shooting that day. But it's also like you get to see a different side of his character that we never we haven't seen before, which yeah. is also great. Yeah, it was also, it's the first time you see Tommy. Uh, I guess there's the golf episode in, mm. ep or yeah, in episode two. But it's the first time you see Tommy, like, not really in a suit. It's like, it's the first glimpse we have of, like, oh, mm. this is what Tommy's like when he's not at the office. And that was also, it's a lot of fun, you know, working with our wardrobe department to be like, okay, what kind of things would he wear on the mm. weekend? So, we, like, where would you like to see Tommy go in the future? Like, what would you, what kind of storylines would you like to see him? Um, it's interesting. I think that Tommy as a character would 
I think he doesn't want the spotlight. He would never actually want to be the mayor, oh. but he wants to like assist. He wants to be the man behind the man. You know what I mean? He wants mm. to be the one pulling the strings behind the scenes. And so I'd love to see Tommy get more tenacious in his work goals and really kind of become like a Lady Macbeth figure. You know what I mean? Like really just like <laughs> yeah. turbocharge the the political like machinations and um, and work his way up that way. You guys, the cast, have such like amazing chemistry. Is that something that you guys worked on before? Like, or is it just like natural? Like how? Um, so this is one of those things that's a weird silver lining of the pandemic. Like I would not wish the pandemic mm -hmm. on anyone again, but one of the few silver linings we got was uh, we started shooting the show right before the pandemic started. And then when it started, we shut down the show and none of us knew anything. So we would always do this. We would Zoom with each other just all mm -hmm. the time. Like we would check in with each other. We were on a text thread. We would ask how we are and check in about our families and stuff. And so I think we like hardcore bonded over over a few months, the first few months of the pandemic, mm -hmm. in a way that like on another show you might not normally be able to mm -hmm. do until like season four or five. So we're already like on a season five level of intimacy with each other. We're just like <laughs> very comfortable with each other because we had that sort of like outside of work social relationship for so long. So when we came back to work, it was like, oh, well, we know each other. We're comfortable with each other. So let's just like kind of get this going. Mm, but you can you can really feel it come off the screen. Like I would believe that Tommy and Michaela have been best friends like since like babies. Like that's how, yeah, that's yeah, the thanks. vibe. Yeah, and that's, uh, Vela lives right down the street from me. Like we have like just gotten drinks together before, you know, it's <laughs> it's that kind of thing. And I'm I'm glad it shows because that's, that's also one of the things I think is so much better about season two is, um, you know, we, we have vaccines now. Like season one, we finished it in the pandemic, but it was still like, oh, we don't really know how to do this. Mm -hmm. We're a little uneasy about coming to work. And this season, everyone just felt so much safer and so much more comfortable being on set. And so when you couple that with like our social relationships, it was like, yeah, all bets are off. We can just kind of have fun behind the scenes. And um, I'm glad it's showing on camera, you know. So what has been your what is your favorite scene to to film of season two? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. There's a there's a bit coming up in a couple episodes where. I don't want to ruin the joke, but I got to work with a um, a special effects team mm -hmm. because something needed to explode in my face. <laughs> and it's like, I, again, I, it's like so many acting jobs are just like, here are the lines, like hit your mark, say the lines. And so I don't know why I'm so obsessed with the idea of like doing things that are physically funny to me. You know what I mean? Mm. It's like, I think that like physical slapstick humor is kind of gone out of style in the last couple decades. I mean, like, mm. I guess it still exists in cartoons and like puppet shows and stuff, but like as far as live action comedy, it hasn't really, you know, I, I just saw um, The Lost City with Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum. Mm -hmm. And that felt like such a refreshing, like, I, I don't think we've had a comedy like that in a few years where there's so many just physical gags, you know? Yeah. And so I love that kind of stuff. So that, and that was, I, I think that just sticks out in my head because it's the first time I've had to work with a special effects team, you know, like they had mm -hmm. to, build a rig that would safely explode in my face. And that feels like <laughs> new and thrilling to me. You know, it feels novel. And so um, I'm really excited for people to see that. It's like a one second joke. It's literally like <laughs> the explosion happens and we cut away, but I'm so excited for people to see it. They will know once they see it, they will know. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so the, like season two or not season, season two and season one, is that like some amazing guest stars? Like who would you, who would be like your dream guest star? Oh man, that's such a good question. Um, I feel like th this feels like a cheater's answer, but like, <laughs> I feel like what we can get away with on the show because it takes place in LA and mm. we very proudly claim LA as like its own weird character is like, we can bring in celebrity guests to play themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like we just had Fran Drescher, but she mm. played a character named Angelica Masters, but we also had Andy McDowell last season playing Andy McDowell. And so it's like, I kind of like, there are people I want to meet who aren't actors where it's just like, I just want them to play themselves. Like, I love Edgar Wright movies. He's like my number one director. Mm -hmm. So if Edgar Wright came on and just played himself as Edgar Wright, I'd be like, great. I just want to meet Edgar Wright. I don't even want to be in a scene with him. I just want to hang out with him on set and like pick his brain, you know? <laughs> so, um, so like, I know you, you have quite a, like a, a big comedy background. So who are your comedy icons? That's a great question. Um, I, I'll get the like kiss ass answer out of the way, which is like obviously Tina Fey and Robert Carlock. And it's like, I know that sounds like I'm sucking up to my bosses, but like truly I, I graduated college and I moved to New York and like 
that's when I like watched 30 Rock front to back and mm. everything clicked for me. I was like, oh, I get this. This is like so my sense of humor, you know, and I watched Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. I, I watch all their stuff and I never would have thought I would have been on one of their shows. So it's like truly really a dream come true to work with them. They are like legends in my eyes. I grew up staying up late and watching like all of the late night Comedy Central specials. So it's like a lot of my adolescent brain like formative years it's like a mix of you know like uh like mitch hedberg and like mm. maria bamford who's actually on next week's episode so it was like so <laughs> cool meeting her you know um i grew up watching uh conan o'brien and oh, um i love like, conan. He, like i'm sorry he's I'm the just... best he's the no <laughs> no please <laughs> he's the be- i think like kids nowadays kids nowadays you know like i think that younger people sort of like don't understand I, it's the generation above us. I think for them, mm-hmm. it was like David Letterman. It's like, oh, David Letterman's doing like weird things with late night that no one else is doing. And I think there are a lot of people doing that now. There's so many cool people in that yeah. late night variety space. But like for our generation, it was Conan. It was like yeah. Jay Leno was like, uh, you know, a respectable late night host. But then Conan came on and like really did weird stuff. And that was so much fun to watch. And it was so exciting. And so I think a lot of my voice is informed by that too. Mm. Perfect answer. Um <laughs> So, okay, so this is the question we ask everybody. So I have to ask you oh, this, boy. but who was your first celebrity crush? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, that's tough. Um, uh, the Pink Power Ranger, I think. Ah, uh, Kimberly. I was, yes, Kimberly. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the actress's name, but I was such a big <laughs> Power Rangers kid. And like, I like, I still am. I feel like, like everyone was who's my age, you know, mm-hmm. but then like after two, three years, they stopped. And I was like, no, I kind of kept going. Like I loved Power <laughs> Rangers. And I feel like Kimberly was definitely my, it was either Kimberly Kimberly, or um, probably like Topanga from Boy Meets World mm. or uh, Kelly Kapowski from Saved by the Bell. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm going to go with Kimberly. <laughs> Karen, you're back. Yeah, Are you sorry. back? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Okay, great, great. <laughs> um, now I think I got I got the ending of your Kimberly. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's that's where we landed. That's the final answer. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Big I was a big Power Ranger fan too. Mighty Morphin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're the same age. We're the same yeah, generation. Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah. Conan and Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, Topanga, definitely the same generation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but Mike, thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. This was lovely. Um, My just... pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This is this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to see what's coming up and what's coming up for your career. Because I mean, really. Oh gosh, I mean, I I wish I could say with certainty, but you know, this industry, you never really know. Mm. I'm uh, I'm trying to develop an animated series and trying to develop a couple feature scripts and uh, auditioning for stuff. So hopefully, um, something something concrete I can announce soon. But for right now, it's just uh, trying to open more doors. Uh, thank you so much. This was really really lovely. Thank you. That was our interview with Mike Bellin. From Mr. Mayor, you can watch Mr. Mayor on DSTV now. From now. On DSTV now. From now. On now. It's on now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you can watch it on DSTV now. Um, so, Leanne, how have you been? Let's do uh, crushing on. What have you been crushing on this last week? I, um... I've been crushing on Spotify. And I know that sounds like a cop-out, but like... <laughs> Obviously, I was crashing on Mr. Mayor because I watched it for this episode, but we've already spoken about that at length. And so I didn't really watch much else or have time to consume much else. But so we have this team meeting every morning and our manager at some point brought up like this weird question and answer thing. And he was like, would you rather never be able to read, lose the ability to read or never be able to listen to music again? And I was like, oh, this is really tough because, like, obviously you need to read for your job and, like, you need to read in life because, like, words are everywhere. But then I was like, what what is life without music? Like, your favorite TV shows Mm. or movies won't be the same if there's no sound to it. Like, there's no – and you can't listen to music. And so I think, like, that kind of got me to remember to listen to music because I haven't been doing it as frequently. I've been, like, listening to talk radio. I know I sound like an old person. Don't judge me. Um, 
and or Still listening to podcasts, podcasts. <laughs> or watching TV. Like, so I haven't been actually listening to music. And so I've honestly been crashing on Spotify because I just refound a love of like putting on a good playlist in the morning or like mm. finding a good piece of like playlist to, to work to and hear. It's it really does have the ability to change your mood and change your perspective mm. and like I've always found it weird how it can change your mood and like lift you up or give you energy and strength and like yeah so crushing on music whatever that means to you I suppose <laughs> I'm still thinking about the question like surely I mean giving up reading is easier because you someone can read to you or you can listen to like an audio book or something. Like, that's what my team said but then I was like reading is so integral to my work so I was like yeah but someone I could read your all... work to you I suppose but it's not the same <laughs> also I really do love reading so I love like the fact that you can get lost in a book because it's like I mean reading a book is creating a form in your mind and so like but that... audio books kind of give you their vibe too I suppose yeah I don't <laughs> I'm know. just like I'm I just, just like that question is flawed because, <laughs> because one of them is definitely not being able to listen to anything is very difficult. Because then, well, it's no, it's not listen to anything. It was just listen they're not to listening music. to music. Like you can't read. Mu- I mean, you can, but it's gonna be a lot tougher to make it up in your head after you read it. So yeah, do you know what I mean? There's no, there's no alternative for that. Um, anyway, imagine you're watching a show and then like the the notes come up at the bottom of the screen and you have to pretend you have to like imagine what that sounds like. The yeah, no, music. it's not the same. <laughs> like I the remember same. there was off the back of Bridget and someone found that scene of them in the library, and they mm. like it was like a two minute clip and it was like here's the scene without the music. Yeah, and I, I mean it was I've been obsessed with it. <laughs> Of course you have been. I've been obsessed. There was there's somebody, I can't remember what their name is, something with a Sin, Sintec, Sintel, oh, that's the people that sponsor the episode. Um, Cymbalina, I don't know. Somebody um, who was do, who was taking out the music from the, the scenes in Bridgerton and it was just, I don't know, I just, I loved it. It was so like, so intense mm. and powerful. Like, oh, beautiful. Not, I mean, the music does add to it, but seeing it without music just also shows like how impactful the words and the acting and the mm. mise-en-scene is. But yeah, uh, that sounds cool, Leanne. No judges. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for me, I've been watching a lot of sketch comedy this week and I've been crushing on a black lady sketch show. So it's about to start at season three, or I think it just started in the US, which means it's probably going to come to show Max sometime soon. But season one and two is on Showmax. And it's just so funny. Like, like the whole thing is that black women haven't been given a lot of space in comedy, in sketch comedy. Like in, mm-hmm. like in Loving Color, they did. And in, on Mad TV, there was some. But the great thing about a black lady sketch show is that the, the writing team is all black women. The, the cast is all black women. And they, so like the, um, the skits, I mean, the sketches aren't necessarily just about like, oh, the black woman struggle. It's about like yeah, random things, like you know, when you like go for your nails, and like the the the, the lady, the, the nail lady keeps telling you about like about her life, but she also keeps like adding prices on. But you're also awkwardly trying to tell her, no, I don't need this. Like <laughs> you don't need to add an extra for the cuticle, whatever treatment. And like so, then the, the, this kid will be like the two of them talking, but in the middle of the talking, they're also like negotiating prices and stuff like that. But yeah. the, the pacing is done so brilliantly, and there's it's just like you can feel like it's just people being comfortable in who they are, and it's like you are sitting with mm. your friends and you're just laughing about like like I mean you always say that I always have this like random memories. With, and then I start laughing to myself. It's like it feels like you're doing that on on TV. Like these people having these random. I remember that time that girl fell on the stairs and she dropped like three gallons of hair gel, and it was funny. Like something random yes. like that, and they'll make a skit out of that. Yes, <laughs> like it's just it just feels so free and funny, and like there's no constraints. You don't have to. Like with Saturday Night Live, they often have to play to everybody. There's a whole big audience saying, this is not funny, this is funny, whatever. Whereas a black mm. lady sketch show can just be who they want to be. And and like it doesn't have to be everything for everybody. 
So yeah, you can watch a Black Lady Sketch show on Showmax. And that's it for our show. Catch us again here next week. So, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Today's episode is brought to you by Syntec. Syntec is a technology company that sources and distributes industry-leading products and brands from around the world. We'll also be giving away some cool hampers in the coming weeks, so be sure to follow our social media for a chance to win. You need a doctor? I am a doctor. I should have died years ago. People all over the world have my disease. I'm here. To find a cure, we have to push the boundaries, take the risks. If you're gonna run, do it now. One of the most compelling and conflicted characters in Sony Pictures' universe of Marvel characters comes to the big screen as Oscar winner Jared Leto transforms into the enigmatic anti-hero Michael Morbius, dangerously ill with a rare blood disorder and determined to save others suffering his same fate. Dr. Morbius attempts a desperate gamble. While at first it seems to be a radical success, a darkness inside of him is unleashed. Will good override evil? Or will Morbius succumb to his mysterious new urges? Not exactly. I have increased strength and speed and some form of bat radar. What else can I do? Me, you can find at Karen Walby on Instagram, at Karen Walby's with an S on Twitter, and sign up for my newsletter. Wildest Dreams at wildestdreams.substack.com The podcast can be found at Crushing on Pod on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. You can find us at What's IGN Crushing On on YouTube. And you can find more information about this and all our other episodes on our website, crushingonpodcast.com. Send any feedback to mail at crushingonpodcast.com. And you can send us voice notes at plus two seven seven eight three six two two five six six. Join our Facebook group, Crushing on Club, where we chat about the show, celebrity news, recommendations, the whole shebang. The show is produced by me, Karen, as well as Rebecca Barchers and Leanne Philipson. The show is edited by Rebecca Barchers. Our logo was designed by Nathifa Maruf. And the show was created in partnership with IGN Africa. If you like the show, tell everyone that you can, any way that you can. Keep up to date with episodes by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please rate and review the episodes on Apple Podcasts, as it helps others to find the show. We'll be back next week with another in-depth conversation with a pop culture lover. See you then. See you then.